My name is Sarah and I am an autistic software developer myself. I work at a company called 89 Grad, which translates to 89 degrees in English. And before I start, I do want to quickly thank them for their support, which not only allows me to do the job I love every day, but also made it possible for me to be here today at DjangoCon Europe and talk to you about autism. Throughout this presentation, I will use some illustrations from Daniela Schreiter's graphic novels, which, by the way, are a great read. Now, I want to start with something that might be obvious, but nevertheless is important, being that every person is unique. And it probably doesn't surprise you that this is also valid for autistic people. This also means that what I'll be telling in this presentation is my story. It's based on my own experience and some research I've done. And although I'm trying to give a differentiated picture, everything I say cannot and will not be equally true for all autistic people. The thing I want to talk, talk about is officially called Autism Spectrum Disorder, although I'll just call it Autism for short. And this includes also previously separately diagnosed conditions, such <coughs> as Asperger's syndrome, for example. Autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder, which means that the autistic brain works different than most brains. Autism is a condition that people have from birth or early childhood, and they have it their whole lives. It's not a disease which also means that it cannot be cured, and it's not caused by vaccines, just to make that clear. In fact, like a lot of autistic people and also others, I am convinced that the autistic brain is, not, is just working differently. It's not broken or something, and it's not working less well than the more traditional kind of brains. And therefore, it is a good idea to get rid of the word disorder and talk about neurodiversity instead. But let's have a look in a little bit more detail at how exactly the autistic brain works differently. Autistic people are detail-oriented. You might have heard about that. It's the reason they hire us to test your software. And although it's true that I'm good at details, I do have other qualities than that, too. And this certainly doesn't necessarily mean that I want to be testing software my whole life. In fact, for me personally, it's even worse. I am as addicted as most of you to the high of developing new features that I would like to forget about testing sometimes. But the real question is, what makes me good at details? Well, it seems that the automatic filtering of details and things that are out of focus in general doesn't really work for autistic people the same way as it does in most people's brain. And therefore, most of those details, they come in unfiltered. And if we do want to filter them, we do that kind of manually. This also means that my world is full of details all the time. I don't put on my detail glasses to find some bugs and then take them off again before I go home. No, the world just enters my bra brain full HD all day. If I walk through a mall or train station, details on people's clothes, echoing noises, uh, f perfumes and cigarette smells, they fill up my sensory buffers faster than I can manually process them. On a rainy day, for example, my brain doesn't filter out the sense of each single raindrop on my skin, making walking through the rain one of my most hated things in life. Um, another example is that when sitting in a restaurant, my brain doesn't filter out the voices of the people at the other tables talking, which can be interesting sometimes, but most of, most of the time it's just very exhausting. 
I had a birthday party recently uh, with only autistic people, and very spontaneously, throughout the whole evening, there was always just one person talking at a time. And we, we hadn't said anything about it, but this just seemed the way that all of us were most comfortable. So, as you can see, being detail-oriented both has its positive and its negative signs. The most annoying thing, however, is that it often comes combined with hypersensitivity. And when I say hypersensitivity, I mean hypersensitivity in a way that can make you very uncomfortable or even sick. Um, I personally don't have huge problems with hypersensitivity. I am most sensitive to sound. Um, and I also did have this problem that I couldn't walk on grass when I was a kid. But right now, uh, my sensitivity to touch remains only visible in the problem that I have with rain. But some other autistic people, they have much stronger hypersensitivities. And for them, they can cause nausea or severe headaches, and they often mean that they need to adapt their environment in order to be able to function normally. It is fairly obvious that if someone's very sensitive to light, for example, or to fluorescent lighting in particular, or to sounds or smells, this has implications also for their working environment. Small adaptations can really make a huge difference. But we shouldn't forget that an awful lot of sensory inputs happen already on the way to work allowing for flexible working hours that make it possible for people to avoid rush hour um, can help. For autistic people, optimizing the way to work can really make a big difference. I optimized my way to work, for example, both for uh, avoiding crowds and predictability. I do this by taking the train rather than other public transport or bicycle. For me, bicycle scores low on predictability as it is highly dependent on the weather. And as I already said, I'm highly sensitive to rain. But for somebody else, taking the bike can be a perfectly valuable um, way to, to travel to the workplace. On top of that, I only take certain trains to avoid crowds at the main station. And I only use a particular exit which is less crowded than the other ones, and also it doesn't require me to, grow to, to go through an underground passage with horrible acoustics. Overall, we should keep in mind that sensory sensitivity is a very personal thing. Some people might even be less sensitive than average to certain senses. So ask the person involved what helps most. He or she will know best. And even if you find it hard to believe that someone can be so sensitive to something, take sensory sensitivities uh, seriously. So until now, I've talked about the fact that autistic people perceive and process information differently. Also, they need to survive in an environment that is not really designed for the way their brain functions. And they do this by either adapting the environment or by learning new skills themselves. Those things that they, they need to learn, they're often things that nobody ever teaches them, as those things come natural to most people, so they don't really, other people don't really know how to explain them to us. So this combination of factors um, makes that it's not surprising that among autistic people, we will find a good amount of creative problem solvers. And indeed, autistic people often are creative. But the fact that we don't see this at first sight is related to a flaw in our thinking. Because we automatically link creativity to flexibility, to the liking of chaos even. But However, it is possible to be creative without being flexible. And autistic people often possess exactly this combination of characteristics. This is also very nicely illustrated by this amazing piece of art by my friend Fabian Siegel, which is showing a sorted pomegranate. But 
But what does it mean when I say that my brain's not flexible? It means that my brain doesn't work without a plan. If my plan gets broken, my brain panics. There's no coming further until a new plan is in place. I love structure and routine as they diminish the chance that plans get broken. I can't let go of plans. I can't learn to go with the flow. Believe me, I've tried, and it simply doesn't work. So my life's all about planning, structure, and routine. But it's also about learning new things. The fact that my brain isn't flexible doesn't mean that I don't want to learn and discover new things. It just means that it's more of a challenge. It means that if I keep a good amount of planning and routine in the mix, I will have some energy left for new and unexpected things. If I try to do it without planning, however, all my energy will be lost in panicking, and I won't be able to discover new things. All in all, this flexibility problem is a bit of a bummer. Of course, we can say positive things about it as well. We can say, who finds structure important will do her best to write structure code, hopefully. But after all, software development companies often want to be cutting edge and agile, and they might not always know how hiring an autistic employee can fit into this picture. To those people, I want to say that it's not all bad news. I might not have full-fledged flexibility the way you define it. I have something else. I call it planned flexibility, and I use this quite often myself when I'm exploring unknown territory. So it's proven to work. To understand uh, how planned flexibility works, we first need to have a look at what the tra traditional idea of a plan looks like. And it looks, for most people, probably something like this picture on the left. It's very simple, <coughs> but it doesn't bring you very far in a world that's quite complex. Luckily, my brain is also capable of more complex plans. Plans that contain a plan A, B, C, and D. Plans that contain decision points. Plans that look more like this picture on the right. So, if I ask you for the plan, which might very well happen, and you don't know it yet, which is also not improbable, don't be afraid to tell me so. If you know when you will know more, then tell me that. If you know that it will be one of a limited amount of possibilities, then tell me the possibilities. In fact, I would rather construct a more complex plan that works than being told a simple plan that you already know is not going to be followed. Of course, the weakest points of planned flexibility still are the decision points. I will need time to process them, and someone without a plan doesn't. I can get stuck on them due to internal or external circumstances, and I might need help to continue at this point. But all in all, I do like the possibilities that planned flexibility gives me, and I think it works quite well in a lot of situations. Back at the workplace, this means that hot desking might be a problem. I wouldn't be able to come to work not having a plan on where to sit. Or maybe I could, but it would cost me such a huge amount of energy each day that I wouldn't be comfortable doing it, and it probably wouldn't last very long either. For a lot of other situations, planned flexibility is a lot better than no plan at all. Structured meetings help a lot, as oral communication is not very structured by default. I personally feel that I can handle structured meetings very well, but the unstructured variety causes me trouble sometimes. A good example of a well-structured meeting is the daily stand-up meeting from the Scrum Method. Another thing is that it's always a good idea to leave autistic people time to adapt to new situations, even if you don't understand. Again, planning needs are very individual, so ask your specific employee or colleague what helps him most. 
And now I want to tell you about my most spectacular ex escape from small talk. It happened a couple of years ago when I was still working at university. And to, together with some other members of our team, we were traveling to a project meeting of a research project we were working on. Now, most of the other people that were coming along either had a presentation to give or played a very important role in this project. I, however, had neither of those reasons to attend this meeting, but they had taken me along anyway. And when I asked our group leader why they had taken me and what I was supposed to do there, he said, just talk to the people during the breaks, do some networking. And these words had kept me thinking during our train ride. I remembered coffee breaks from previous meetings. They had been horrible. I hadn't managed to keep a single conversation going. I was so stressed that I forgot other people's names. And I couldn't find the right, uh, the right words to answer their questions. So as I replayed those images in front of my eyes, going to some place where this would be my main responsibility felt like the most scary and wrong thing to do at the time. So as the train slowed down and came to a stop, I grabbed my purse and got out. And there I was, standing on an empty platform in a French village in the middle of nowhere, breathing the freedom of not having to do small talk. <laughs> well, I'm not telling you this because I'm particularly proud of it. I'm telling you it because it illustrates how hard those casual social interaction situations can be for autistic people. And I'm also telling you this because this is not the end of the story. Of course, after I got back to Switzerland, I needed to talk to our professor about this incident. Well, I would have preferred to write it all down so that he could read it, but he hadn't accepted that. Also, my request of taking someone from our team I was comfortable with with me was declined. And so I was brought by two friendly colleagues to his office. No way to escape this time. He asked one question after the other. Why this had happened, what I planned to do next, how it could be that I had been able to talk on previous occasions but wasn't now, what he had done wrong. It went on and on. And although the time that he left in between his questions might have been long enough for most people to answer, it wasn't for me. And so the queue of questions that I was trying to find the right words as an answer for in my head grew longer and longer as I sat there for more than an hour without being able to say a word. Now, this was the beginning of the end of my time at university. It also was the trigger for me to seek diagnosis. I've learned a lot since this day. I've become a software developer, which is great on itself. And I do now know that although autistic people communicate differently and we often cannot fulfill the standard social interaction expectations, which include small talk, reading body language and facial expressions and socially accepted lying, for example, this doesn't mean that communication is not possible <coughs> and problems do not have to become this big. So here are some of the things I've learned. My detail-oriented brain often needs very detailed information. Also, I can cannot guarantee that I will see what the expectations are if they are not made explicit. So here I need my coworkers to be a little bit more verbose than they usually are. I also use written communications in those situations where that makes me feel more comfortable, even if often those are situations where it's considered unusual, because the other person's sitting right next to me, for example. In the beginning, having a single contact person to direct all my questions to helped me a lot. It gave me something to hold on to 
in a working environment and team where everything else was new. In the meantime, I do ask other members of my team as well, but I'm still glad to have a fall fallback plan. I have been very clear from the beginning that I want someone else to be the client interface, and I don't take phone calls. These things cost me a lot of energy, and other people do them much better anyway. Of course, misunderstandings will happen, but if both sides are open and constructive, I think that they can be resolved before they become huge problems. Again, everyone's different, and this hold probably holds true for communication even more than for the other topics I've covered. So, after all of those things that I've told you, it might already be clear that the day-to-day -day life of autistic people often costs a lot of energy. Sadly, energy is a limited resource, also for us. Which leaves us with the question what, of what happens when all those details, unexpected situations and social interaction gets too much. The situation where this happened is called a overload, and it is often compared with a stack overflow in computers. There's just too much data coming in, and the brain has no capacity left to process it anymore. Depending on a lot of factors, this can lead to either a meltdown, which is the aggressive volcano eruption, so to say, or a shutdown. If I feel an overload coming, I need to find a quiet place to take a break from all of those things that I had too much of, being sensory input, social interaction, and unexpected things. This also means that this is probably not the best time to try and talk to me. I know people might want to calm me down or wonder what has gone wrong, and these might all be valid things to talk about at a later point in time, but not this one. Now, I am very lucky that at 89 Grad, they are very open for part-time work and flexible working hours. This gives me the flexibility to get home before my energy level reaches zero and compensate at any other time. This is actually one of the two most important things they do for me that make my life easier. The other one is that they treat me just like anybody else, except when I ask them not to. And at this point, they evaluate the accommodations I ask for based on how doable they are for them, and not on whether they think I really need them. What they get in return is me being at my best. And I'm not Rain Man, but I do have a unique set of qualities making me good at what I do. Some of them are typical for autistic people. Others are just me. I am highly motivated to solve problems and write good code. As there are a lot of other autistic people out there, who are highly motivated to put their skills into practice. Some of them want to be software testers or developers like me, but a lot of them also want to do something totally different. After all, it's not surprising that not every person has to, wants to, or should be working in IT, not even if they're autistic. Now, you might have noticed that each time when I said something about accommodations, I also mentioned that you should ask the person involved what helps them most. This, of course, implies some self-knowledge of this person. For me, my diagnosis has helped me immensely in knowing what my needs are. Once you know that your brain works differently, it's easier to accept that you also have different needs in day-to-day -day life. Another thing that can help, uh, especially in communicating those needs for accommodations and uh, resolve misunderstandings, is coaching. When I was preparing for this talk, I visited Specialisten in Bern, which is a software company working with autistic people. And they said that one of the most important differences um, with other companies is that with them, 
coaching is inclusive. Now, this doesn't mean that forcing autistic people to talk about their feelings one hour a week. It just means that coaches are there at the same offices and they are available to all employees. Of course, this is not practicable at any company, although I think larger ones should really think about it, as this is something that benefits all employees, and not only those who are autistic. Sadly, in practice, based depending also on your location, both adult autism diagnoses and good coaches are maybe hard to come by. But I do want to finish on a more positive note by saying some things about our community. Therefore, let me first explain to you why community is important. When I was a kid, my parents sent me to our local scouting group. They thought I was going to learn something there about life and being social, and I don't blame them. I even believed this myself at some point. However, it was terrible. It didn't have a purpose. Social interaction was not regulated at all. And on top of that, they liked to do surprise activities every second month or so. It was hard all the time. And I wasn't rewarded with the feeling that I had accomplished something or was doing something I was interested in. But this doesn't mean that I want to do things on my own all the time. I want to do stuff together with other people, too. The most important thing to me, however, is uh, to combine this with something that matters to me, which is where our community comes in. Now, I don't want to do my presentation all over again, replacing company with community. I wouldn't have time for that. But, of course, most of the same things apply here that I already mentioned for the workplace. And our Django community is already doing a lot of things very well. By valuing self-care, for example, by having quiet places and communication batches at conferences, or by documenting not only their software, but their community as well. All of those things show that an inclusive mindset and accommodations benefiting one group of people also help others. This also brings me to the end of my talk. I will not take questions right now, but I will answer questions on Slack. Or if you want to ask me something in person, don't be afraid to come and talk to me during one of the breaks. I'm just a normal person with a slightly differently functioning brain. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah.